Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in with us again this week. I'm John. I'm Mindy. And today we're going to talk about something that's super important for all radar detectors, not just Thea, and that is the concept of SNR, or signal to noise ratio. Mm -hmm. Now, SNR is, in my opinion, probably the most important, or at least one of the most important aspects of a radar detector. Having good SNR is, is important for absolutely everything. Yeah, so <coughs> signal to noise ratio, for those of us who don't live the engineering life that you live, uh, talk to us a little bit about um, why, you know, the signal strength versus the noise that it's also taking in. Like, what's the difference between, like, good and bad, yeah. or what, what makes it good or what makes it bad? So, w without getting super in-depth, the concept of SNR is, is actually pretty simple. Um, you can think of it as just being the, di the difference between the, the peak of the signal that you care about, whether that's music or a radar signal, Mm -hmm. um, or, a, or a visual signal, any kind of waveform, the peak of that signal, the loudest point that it is, how far above noise or ambient or nothingness essentially that it is. Hmm. Um, so when you see a very, very, very loud signal in a really quiet room, there's a big difference between the loudest it gets and the quietest, and that's got really high signal to noise ratio. Um, <laughs> but in a, in a more noisy environment, signals are naturally going to have a smaller SNR. So when we're talking about SNR, um, what it, you know, I obviously understand what a signal is, but what is noise in this SNR case that we're talking about? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it, it's kind of a generic concept, and we could get into how mathematically noise is, like different types of noise, how like Gaussian noise, but all that you guys really need to care about functionally is that noise is anything that's not the signal that you care about. It's kind of this generic, abstract, random noise floor compromised of um, it, in radar, it's RF noise. It could be could be phase noise. If you are in a theme park that's really noisy, screaming kids. Yeah, your noise floor is comprised <laughs> of screaming kids, rides, uh, announcers. Think of it as just this generic blend of things that you don't care about. Um, with radar detectors, it is interesting too, because um, any time that you do anything to a signal, it's not perfect, and that adds noise. Um, I think an LNA is a really good example. Yeah. So for those that who aren't familiar real quick with LNAs, I know a lot of guys are, but a lot of gals are, but not everybody. Can you just quick two seconds about yeah. LNAs? So uh, LNA is a low noise amplifier, and just like how I said, anytime you do something to a signal, you add noise, that includes amplifying it. Okay. Um, so obviously so we want to detect <coughs> radar from really, really far away. So when the signal comes into the horn, we run it through this device that boosts the signal strength. Now, an LNA doesn't know what's the signal that you care about it versus uh, noise. So it's a, it like just a true amplifier. generically amplifies everything. Okay. And not only that, so it, it is amplifying some of the background noise inherent in your signal. But that process of amplifying it also adds additional noise measured in decibels. Yeah. So if you mm -hmm. use like a really, really cheap amplifier, you could destroy the signal fidelity that you care about. Okay. And now not all LNAs, all LNAs are created the same either, right? Exactly. So this is actually a spec. If you look at any type of um, microwave equipment, um, every single one will tell you how much noise it adds to the signal hmm. uh, when you use it. And that ranges from connectors, like even just the act of passing the signal through a cable will add a certain amount of noise. Yeah. Um, it's really, really crazy stuff. And you have to be super careful every single step of the way um, to minimize that noise figure through your entire system. Otherwise, you wind up with bad sensitivity and bad selectivity. Yeah, so thinking about <laughs> when you're trying to see the signal that you're actually looking for with a higher no noise floor or lower sensitivity, right? All those things come into play with how quality your signal is that you're actually looking for, right? Exactly. I mean, one, <coughs> one kind of easy way um, to, to explain it is selectivity versus sensitivity is let's just say that you're listening to a piece of music and um, I ask you, I want to know is music playing, if you have headphones on? If you can hear something, even if it's distorted, you can still answer the question, mm -hmm. yeah, there's music playing. Yeah. If it's a really, really bad uh, sound system, you might it, the distortion might be so bad you don't even know what song it is, but you can still kind of hear that there's a beat and a flow to it, and hence your sensitivity is okay. Um, selectivity is if I say, what song is playing? Okay. So that's, that's kind of where it gets into, like, is this a BSM or is it a CW signal, or which CW signal is it? Okay. Um, if you don't have uh, good SNR, 
you might not be able to hear the words of the song, and then you can't tell what it is. Sure. So it's kind of like the quality versus just, the, is there something here? Mixtapes from the yeah. 90s. It affects both of those, yeah. So I guess that leads me to think, like, when you're talking about like traditional or legacy radar detectors versus Thea, what's the difference? Because I know there's like the V1, G2, the 360C, the R7, those all have LNAs on them. Yeah. What makes Thea different? What makes her so special? In terms of SNR, the main difference that Thea has versus legacy detectors is a tremendously higher signal to noise ratio. Um, we use really expensive components um, that added minimal amounts of noise everywhere from the LNA to the synthesizer to even like just other amplifiers that we use. Um, and then we spent a lot of money on high quality circuit boards to minimize the losses that, get, that the signal ha happens to the signal when it goes through there. We designed Thea to be a high SNR system from the from beginning. The yeah, exactly. That was kind of our whole design goal with it. So it was something that we paid attention to specifically. So when you think about <coughs> CW and CW discrimination, is this why legacy detectors can't see, oh, that's a stalker, or that's exactly. a falcon, because the noise... Uh, the noise floor obscures the differences in CW signals. So okay. when you look at like a, a BSM, there's a ton of differences there. That's, that's easy. It's like mm -hmm. if you listen to distorted music, you could tell if it was classical music or rock music because they sound so different. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of how BSMs and CW are. Even with poor signal-to-noise ratio, detectors can so kind of still tell what's what. <coughs> uh, but when it gets down to CW, those signals have such little differences that if you don't have incredible SNR, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. And I think this is something that we can really, really easily visually show you over on the whiteboard. Yeah, let's go do it. All right, so we talked a little bit about what SNR is um, and why good SNR helps and bad SNR hurts, but I think it helps to really visually look at the signals and understand. So we drew a little illustration for you. Um, over here on the left, you have bad SNR, and then you have good SNR on the right. And one thing that I want to point out is that the signal strength on both of these is actually the same. Mm -hmm. um, this scale over here, what you're looking at, is amplitude or signal strength. And that's measured in something called decibels. Mm -hmm. And then on the bottom, you have frequency. Now, both of these signals, if you look at the peak here and the peak here, they're both at about 30, maybe, maybe minus 35 decibels. Um, which means that they're exactly the same strength. And this is actually what a radar signal looks like. Um, this is exactly what your detectors are seeing if they do what's called an FFT. Now, this line here is the noise floor. And what the noise floor is is the volume level, essentially, of everything that you don't care about. Now, <laughs> The ambient noise we're talking about or background exactly. music or ambulances or whatever. Exactly. Now, Mindy asked a question earlier, which is why, why does Thea care about having a good um, SNR? Mm -hmm. And this is an example of how uh, selectivity, which means the ability to distinguish one signal or one type of a signal from a different signal, um, is so important. So Mindy, let's pretend that you're Thea for a minute. Oh. And we have a radar signal. And I'm asking mm -hmm. you, is this a false alert or is it a Falcon HR, right? So if you have bad SNR. It's hard for me to tell that. <coughs> yeah, but if you have good SNR, I mean, if you, if you look at the peak of these signals, right? Yep. Which is this and this. If I hide all of this, you can't tell the difference between the little tip of the mountain here and the tip of the mountain there. Yep. But if the noise floor is lower because you spent more on quality components, do you see any differences between these two? Absolutely. You can see the two smaller you know, spikes and then the major spike here. It's, exactly. It's, it's magnified, so to speak, right? So these, these two little peaks on the side of the main carrier is, are called sidebands. I knew that. I was just making sure that y'all are paying attention. And those sidebands are a distinguishing feature that we can actually use to tell one type of CW signal from another. But the thing is, the sidebands are not as strong as the carrier, which means they're not at minus 35 dB. They're at minus 60 or minus 70 dB. But because the signal is amplified or magnified, in, in my case, as Thea, I can now see these. Oh, cause you're, yes, because your noise floor is lower. Yes. So one kind of thing that I think is very important to understand is that what this signal looks like underneath the noise floor is exactly like that signal over there. These two are the same thing. 
but the noise floor is higher than this, which means you can't tell the difference. You can almost think of this like, like this is the surface of the ocean, and this is like a mountain beneath it. I mean, you, you, we've heard that like the tallest mountains in the world are beneath the ocean. Well, yeah, you can't see them because the ocean's, uh, the mm -hmm. level of the ocean is covering them up. It's the same so thing with the So by bringing down floor. the noise floor and by uh -huh. amplifying the signal with a, a more powerful LNA, right? Or one with a lower noise figure, yeah. Kay. You're going to be able to. See, I, Athea, exactly. I'm going to be able to see this signal. So let's with let's clarity. do let's do a little example. Uh, let's grab the black marker. So now let's just say that this is a standard detector, right? Now, our crazy good engineers opened it up and made a few tweaks. Let's say that we chose an LNA that added less noise to the signal. So now our noise floor looks like that. Cool. We got more sensitivity which means we can see stuff above the noise floor, but we still don't have a lot of selectivity because we're still covering up the, the characteristic mm. signals. So does that mean uh, in this detector, this example over here, you're going to see more BSMs, potentially? You will, because if BSMs were uh, previously below, below, the floor. The below the noise floor, because they're weaker here, mm -hmm. let's just say this is a BSM. Sure. Eventually, if you keep lowering that noise floor, you're going to see new signals. And that goes for standard weak signals, too. Okay. I mean, you might see a real weak police signal that's far in, off in the distance. And that, that kind of gets, once again, into why this is so important. Let's say now, in addition to our amazing LNA, we manage to keep the radar detector cooler, which heat adds noise. And we redid the whole RF circuitry and made it pretty sensitive. Now, our noise floor might be down here. At which point, yeah, you can start seeing signals that are miles and miles away, as well as maybe some defining characteristics of these signals. So that's, that is, in a nutshell, why having a low noise floor and really, really good SNR is so important. Yeah, that's cool. There's one more example that I want to show. And this is more closely related pretty much just to digital detectors. So this would be what the R7, right? R7, the yep. 360C, the Correct. Uh, new V1G2. Yeah, the V1G2, not the G1. That doesn't apply here. Yep. Um, but these digital detectors, the way that they sample the signal mm -hmm. is that um, they look at them in, in windows. Usually, uh, it's called analysis bandwidth. Um, I know the Escort looks at 10 megahertz chunks. Thea is going to look at a 61.44 megahertz window. Wow. And there's something important to understand here, because this is actually kind of related to Mike Valentine's uh, high probability of intercept patents. Let's say that you're looking at a wide window. We have 20 megahertz of frequency down here. If you sample that and, and integrate 20 megahertz of bandwidth at once, a CW signal only takes up 500 kilohertz, or maybe one megahertz of that bandwidth. Mm -hmm. And if your signal of interest only takes up a very small chunk of the bandwidth, what's left? A lot of uh, white noise, a noise, lot of, exactly. you know. Now, that's not good, because if you take a certain amount of samples, and 90% of those samples are noise, and you start averaging those out, most of your samples are noise. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a worse signal-to-noise ratio. Now, just like if you look at a CW signal with a large amount of bandwidth, most of that's noise, the opposite is true as well. If you look at a small signal with a small bandwidth window, all of your radar detectors sampling ability can kind of be focused just on the single that you care about. Just a little bit of noise. Exactly. Yeah, the little black dots. Um, and this is kind of the theory behind the new V1 G2's um, high, probability of intercept, high probability of intercept patent. They're not looking at big chunks of bandwidth. They're looking at very, very small chunks of bandwidth. And in theory, that gives you a higher signal to noise ratio, a better SNR. And you can see why here. If your signal is almost one megahertz wide, your CW signal, and this is the exact same signal that exactly, is here, it's the okay. same signal. Okay. Um, almost all of your detector sampling ability is going to your sample window is going to be comprised of signal. There's barely any noise in here, and what that lets you do is see the signal in a higher fidelity. You can look here, and you can see the signal stronger in the middle. You can see that maybe there's some zigzag uh, phase noise on, on the outside of the signal. These are things that you can use to identify uh, CW properly. Now, the downside to doing things in hardware is that you're fixed to one of those. So like traditionally, let's, let's look at. Well, I can see there's benefits for here. I can see there's there benefits is. for here. Like here, this is going to let you uh, identify modulated threats like cameras better. Gatso, uh, red flags, exactly. MRCD, MRCT. But this is going to get you more sensitivity on CW police signals. And 
up until now, or really up until Thea, detectors have had to always choose one or the other. Why can't we have both? Exactly. Um, like with, with the saw filter, that's a hardware thing that they put in, just like how on the Escort Max 360C or the Uniden R7, they're, they don't have a saw filter. They designed it to, be, to only look at 10 megahertz chunk in Escort's case. With Thea, because we use such a big FPGA, we can actually run both of these at the same time um, and then have our processor just ask which is which. So you can literally say, hey, there's energy here. OK, mm -hmm. is it CW or is it modulated? And modulated flip to the. If it's modulated, send me a big, huge 60 yeah. megahertz chunk. Yeah. That way I can see everything at once. Yeah. If it's CW, I want you to zoom in and just send me that little chunk to maximize our SNR. Which, when we come back to like CW discrimination, that's how she can say, OK, it's exactly. a stalker, it's a falcon, it's a <coughs> whatever gun it is. Exactly. Right? For the first time, awesome. it's, it's the best of both worlds. And I think you're going to be able to see how cool this is um, mm -hmm. when we take a look at a real signal here in a minute. Cool. All right, so we already looked at the whiteboard, and we understand conceptually what signal-to-noise ratio is, but I thought it would be useful for us to take a look at some actual signals. So what we have here is an MPHB3, which has a pretty distinctive signature for a CW gun. Um, and then we're also going to take a look at a Stalker 2. Up on the screen here, I have Phosphor running, uh, which is part of the GNU radio software package that we use to analyze these signals. And there's nothing actually on the screen right now. This line here in the middle, you can ignore. That's not part of a signal. So we're looking at 33.8 gigahertz right now, and I'm going to go ahead and power on the B. There you go. So here, you can see a signal with excellent SNR. And if I expand the scale here, you can actually see that we have, what are we at, about, I would say about 55 dB is the peak of the signal, and the noise floor is at about negative, 85. So you've got about 30 decibels of SNR there. That's a pretty good dynamic range. Um, one thing I want to draw your attention to is these little spikes at the side of the signal. Now, those are real. That's not an artifact of um, overloading the receiver or anything like that. That is actually sidebands that occur on this signal. And that is a distinguishing feature. And watch what happens if you have poor SNR. I'm going to put my hand in front of the signal, which will damage the SNR. And you're going to see that actually go away. And now, all that that looks like is a single peak. You can't tell that that's a stalker gun. This is something with very poor SNR. That's why we spent so much money creating really, really low noise parts for Thea, uh, whether it's selecting a premium LNA or minimizing the uh, losses through the RF path. This is what most detectors see when they have a CW signal. That's what Thea sees. Let's take a look at another gun. I'm going to go ahead of here and power up the Stalker. Stalker is a really powerful gun, but it is at a different frequency, so I'm going to go ahead and tune Phosphor. Should be at about 34.7. There it is. So. Again, if we have poor SNR, which you can see by the signal being at about minus 80 dB, it looks exactly like the weaker signal from the stalker. But if I increase the SNR, what you see is something really, really interesting. You don't just see this little shape right here, uh, which is kind of the width of the signal, but you also see additional noise. It's very, very faint, but you can see that the signal's wider on either side of this red beam. Now, on the whiteboard, one thing that I mentioned was um, that when you're looking at a wide chunk of bandwidth at once, you're integrating more noise than you would if you look at something narrow. And I want to take a look at that here as well. So I'm going to switch back to the MPH just so I don't have to hold the soccer so I can use both hands on the keyboard. OK, so here we have the MPHB again. We're back at 33.8. And you can see the signal pretty well. But the span that we're looking at here is about 33.78 all the way to 33.82. So you're looking at about 40 megs of bandwidth. That's a lot. And comparatively, the width of the signal only occupies maybe, I don't know, probably about 1 megahertz. So this is how like an Escort Max 360 would see a CW signal. And what we can do with Phosphor that's really cool is simulate what it looks like looking at a smaller chunk of bandwidth by actually zooming in on the signal. OK, I'm going to pause this here. So here, we're only looking at a 
about a two megahertz span. So this signal takes up a tremendous amount um, of that bandwidth. And because of that, we can see all kinds of crazy detail that we couldn't otherwise see if we were looking at a small signal in a wide span. So as I mentioned, this is kind of how Valentine's uh, looking at um, the signal that he sees, but he can't look at these 40 megahertz span. And I'll show you why that's important when it comes to modulated detection now. OK, so here we have MRCT. One thing that you're going to notice is that it's a pretty wide signal. There is one carrier here, one carrier here, one carrier here, and one carrier here. They have poor SNR. Um, and you're actually going to see some sweeping in between these channels. It's very faint right here. Now, this is how Theo would see it. We would see this whole signal at once because we can look at 60 megahertz. Um, let's zoom in and look at one megahertz chunks of the spectrum. So over here, you can see this kind of highlighted area that, that when I uh, hit the key, it slides left and right. This is basically equivalent to a detector looking at a small chunk of bandwidth and sweeping it up and down. So even though there's MRCD present, I'm sweeping here, there's nothing but noise. Sweeping, nothing but noise. Sweeping, nothing but noise. OK, now we found something here, but this is what we're looking at. We're not looking at the bigger picture. So all that you can see is that there is some kind of energy here. It looks kind of like a CW signal. Um, you can see that there's, there's one carrier that's stronger, and it's red. But you don't have the context of being able to look and see the other four signals at once. So let's keep sweeping and see what we see what else we can find. Okay, nothing, 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 nothing. Okay, we get another signal. It looks kind of like the other one. Is this another CW carrier? What's this? We have two two carriers that look like CW in the same channel. You can see that it's it's really really hard if you don't have the context to see in big chunks what else is around. And if I zoom out. Oh, yeah, that's MRCT. You guys could tell just by looking at it visually. Um, this is the power of wide instantaneous bandwidth, but also being able to switch to get a better SNR on a specific CW signal. Um, I think we're entering into a really cool era of detector performance, thanks to FPGAs and the ability to do stuff like this. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed taking a look at this. And let's head back to the table with Min. So that's awesome, uh, getting to see it. I think, thank you for the beautiful sketch pictures you yeah. made for us. Um, what does it mean to the end user, like the person who's buying Thea? That's awesome, you know, we talked about SNR, we know what it is, but how does it impact the Thea user versus the legacy user? I think one thing to keep in mind is that you can never get back SNR once it's gone. And Not while through like software updates or anything, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So. I mean, I mean to a very small extent, but like once, let, let's just say you have a problem with your signal chain. Mm -hmm. uh, once that signal goes through, you can never restore it to where it was. So it's something mm -hmm. that needs to be done right, and it needs to be done right the first time, yeah. and it's very, very difficult to fix with updates. So by designing Thea to be an extremely sensitive detector with an extremely, extremely, extremely high SNR, um, that opens the door down the road for us to have that extra horsepower to play with. You're going to get more sensitivity. You're going to get more selectivity. You're going to get reduced false alerts. You're going to get uh, instant on detection. All those things are possible because of the high SNR of Thea. I think some of it, being honest, like <clears throat> as a typical user who's familiar with what's out there on the market, some of those things are really hard to like digest. Like yeah. More range than what's already out there? Yeah, absolutely. Like. More range than an R7? You know, all you have to do is, for, at least for SNR, is just to open up the detectors, look at the data sheets of the parts on the detectors, and you'll see that there's significant differences in the noise uh, figure that all those parts add. So I'm it's just here to pry for data. Yeah, no, this, this <laughs> is not rocket science. It's just good old-fashioned RF engineering. That's awesome. Well, thank you for filling us in on SNR and teaching us the ways. Um, if you guys enjoyed today's video and you haven't subscribed yet, hit that little button for this, subscribe. This is the way. This uh, we really appreciate your support and what we're doing here and um, looking forward to seeing you guys next week. Take care, everyone. Bye.